Welcome, writers and viewers. I'm Andrew Tonkovich, editor of the Santa Monica Review, coming to you from my family's yurt and broadcast center in the Santa Ana Mountains of Orange County, California. Thank you for attending this virtual reading launch party, supporting the work of the magazine. Tonight we hear six writers offer their witness, testimonial, affirmingly humane and creative literary rebuttal to the disappointment and fatalism so easy to find just now. I'm confident you will find wisdom, humor, artful engagement, and even joyful resistance in their work as we struggle together, separated physically, but in every kind of solidarity. The new issue of the magazine, Fall 2020, has either arrived or is in the mail to you. Thanks to founder Jim Crusoe, Don Girard, and Santa Monica College President Catherine Jeffrey, to engineer Joy Bice, and designers Ming Ye Wei and Vivian Chu. Santa Monica College has for 30 years made our journal part of its commitment to building community, supporting the arts, and encouraging civic literacy. Because we're presenting a full fast paced show, you won't see me until the end with our welcomer momentarily offering his remarks. Then each of our five contributors in order, Ridge, Holy, Murray, Bernard, and Latiolet, briefly introducing themselves and reading just enough of a short story or essay to provoke you into reading more. Thank you for your patience with me and with the technology. The next face you see and voice you hear belongs to a multi-talented writer and scholar. When the legendary Gary Soto shared his work with me years ago, Soto said Keenan Norris was the real thing. Norris holds an MFA from Mills College, PhD from UC Riverside, teaches American literature and creative writing at San Jose State, and serves as guest editor for the Oxford African American Studies Center. Keenan is author of the novels Brother and the Dancer and By the Lemon Tree. His short fiction and nonfiction appears most recently in Alta and the Los Angeles Review of Books. Here to welcome you is Keenan Norris. All right. Hello to everybody. Thank you to everybody who's joined us today. Thank you to Andrew and to SMR, the Santa Monica Review. I can say up front exactly what it is that I am thankful to SMR for, but that's what the story is for. And SMR and I do have ourselves a story. I don't remember who suggested to me <laughs> that I send my short story to the Santa Monica Review. It's a long time ago now, the spring of 2001. Uh, Gary Soto is one possible co culprit. Another, maybe Susan Strait, the great Inland, Inland Empire-based novelist. Uh, after all, Susan encouraged not just me, but all her students to submit our work to literary journals near and far. For me, a kid born and raised in the rough scapes of the IE, Santa, Mo Santa Monica seemed very far away when I was 19 and 20 years old. The idea that its literary lions would weigh and review my work against that of other more experienced, more skilled, more coastal authors was daunting to say the least. But having a good teacher is like listening to a whole library speaking to you one book at a time. So when that library, whether it was Gary's or Susan's or whomever spoke, I simply shut my eyes and went for it, which like voting in 2020 was very analog. Then as now to submit one's work one had to print out one story, drive to the local FedEx, procure a manila envelope and a self-addressed stamped envelope and mail that bad boy off to the ether. Like voting, when one sends off a story, one knows not to expect a lot in return. For all I knew, my ballot wouldn't even be counting. Not much has changed, right? But, but sometimes, God help us, institutions can pleasantly surprise us. And to my very real surprise, a few weeks or months, I forget which, Side note, despite appearances, time in the writing world is actually an object. It's just objectified very differently than in the unwritten world. Anyway, a few weeks or months later, SMR said yes. They said yes. 
I was about 20 years old, give or take a year. And here I was published in a well-regarded literary journal. I received my complimentary copy of the book, which I cherished and still own is perhaps the only extant evidence that the events I'm describing actually occurred. At any rate, it was the beginning of me as a writer, in a public sense at least. Now here I am, 20 years later, give or take a year, having jotted out these lines on a failing old laptop that 2020 has taxed too heavily. Here I am speaking to you about SMR and about the writing life that the journal has helped so many of us to cultivate over these many years. When I published that story with SMR, we were at the cusp of an epoch, a century that has since seen so much elemental change, such harrowing human atrocities and natural terrors, such stones of hope and moments of great progress that it is all beyond any one intelligence to encapsulate. Again, that's why we need to do our part by writing our own uniquely understood worlds. In early 2001, we did not know what we know now because the present never knows the future. But in the written world, we did know some things that the unwritten world seemed so easily to forget. We knew the natural shocks to which, fle to which flesh and psyche are heir. We knew that progress is often an ugly process that requires open disagreement and fighting with each other over what we value. We knew of the human core of all technology and its capacity, therefore, for regress to our most ancient and base impulses. We knew how arbitrary we all are, mere accidents of the earth, of an egg, of a few moments of temporary survival. We knew that all wars, we knew that all wars will be swift and victorious until they begin. We knew that in no world was Donald Trump to be trusted. A lot and not much has changed. We also knew our literatures, plural, in total, an enormous body of experience, reflection and imagination, a whole human library increasingly at all of our disposal. SMR has opened the way for decades worth of emerging writers, each writer a library unto themselves. And the Santa Monica Review continues to provide a platform for the work of some of our greatest keepers of the word. Charles Baxter, T.C. Boyle, Amy Bender, Carolyn C., Harlan Ellison, and the folks you'll hear today. Let's get it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Ryan Ridge. It's great to be here. Thank you for that amazing intro, Keenan. That was, wow. All right, I'm going to read some short pieces. I'm a very short story writer, so... Uh, Let's, let's get at it. This first one's called The Morning the Songbirds Changed Their Tune. And it goes like this. You straightened your chair and a glob of oatmeal dropped from your mouth and into your bowl. And I wondered whether you're going to spoon that glob back into your mouth or whether you're going to sit there staring at your bowl. You stared at the bowl. I stared at you. You looked like something was about to happen. You looked like something was happening. I waited for something to happen. Nothing happened. Then the following. Through the blinds, a horizontal blade of light bisected your face, and your face, and you said, why do I hear John Denver? You said, sweet surrender. I'm hearing the melody from sweet surrender. Are you not hearing the melody from sweet surrender? You said, strike that. It isn't sweet surrender. It's Rocky Mountain High. I'm hearing the melody from Rocky Mountain High. Are you not also hearing the melody from Rocky Mountain High. Am I high? What's in this oatmeal? You said, this is freaky. Now I'm hearing Country Roads. Is that, what is, is that what that song's called, Country Roads? Or is it called Take Me Home? Or called Take Me Home, Country Roads? Whatever it's called, I'm hearing. Do you hear it? Do you hear Country Roads or Take Me Home or Take Me Home, Country Roads or whatever it's called? Do you hear it? Do you? No, I said, listening. I'm hearing Credence. It's unmistakably Credence, late Credence, early 70s Credence. It's as long as I can see the light. And it's funny, it's that song, because right now, at this very moment, there's a slice of sunlight illuminating your forehead. You said, what's happening here? I said, I don't know. I didn't understand. You didn't understand either. We went to investigate our misunderstandings outside. It was sunny outside, obviously. It was loud outside, too. 
We trace the amplified trail of melodies to a group of tanagers perched atop a teenager's martial stack in our neighbor's garage. A microphone plugged into the speaker hissed. A quartet of birds leaned into the mic and launched into the birds. They did eight miles high. Then they did Aerosmith's Walk This Way. We walked closer. We listened, amazed. He said, these songbirds sure have changed their tunes this morning. I know, I said. They're really into some deep cuts from the 70s. I dig it. I flicked my Bic lighter and held it aloft. For an encore, they played Don't Fear the Reaper, and then they flew away. We watched them flying high into the sky and south toward Taos. In a nearby tree, a murder of crows laughed their asses off. They were laughing at us. We were certain of it. We hustled inside. We locked the doors, shut the blinds, turned out the lights. This next one's called The Day They Found the Lump in My Throat. My doctor said sitting is the new standing. I stood up, lit a cigarette, and said, you better sit down, doc. I've got some bad news. We sat. I held his shoulder. I don't have insurance, I said. He patted me on the arm. I don't have any use for money, he said. I'm a friggin'. Our eyes locked. I saw my reflection in his contact lenses. I wanted to tell him I loved him, but my throat felt like a fist. A nurse returned with my neck x-rays. I'll just leave these here, she said and left. May I, the doctor said, intercepting my cigarette. He took a few puffs and examined the images. Am I okay, I said. Is anybody, he said. You live, but you do have a small lump in your throat. I'd like to run a few more tests. Meantime, here. He handed me a prescription. It said, generosity plus love daily. On my way out, the receptionist said I didn't know a dime. It's a miracle, I said. There are only two ways to live your life, the receptionist said, as though nothing is a miracle or as though everything is a miracle. That's Einstein. He was a genius. He and his brother, they started a bagel shop. It's delicious. I passed a couple of waiters in the waiting room and they passed me a sympathy card. It was addressed to someone else, but I opened it in the parking lot. It said, treat yourself. Signed, Sandra and Will. Inside, there were $200 bills. The day was young. I had errands to run, prescriptions to fill, and a lump in my throat. I felt sick enough to live forever. I'm going to do a short one now from New Bad News, a very short one, a one-sentence story that was published in Santa Monica Review uh, a while back. It's called On Acid. I glance at our guru's finger as he's pointing at the moon. But then I realize it's his middle finger pointed at a riot cop, and it's the middle of the afternoon. This next one's called The Night Critical Healthcare Workers Accidentally Ate Pot Brownies. A strange sound came from the ICU. It sounded like a prog rock band, analog synth, drum machine, and a bass guitar, all bleeding together like a blood transfusion. Dr. Albemarle went to investigate. The hallway had a funeral glow. Doc's hands looked blue in the LED lights, and he felt like he might die right there in the cold tiles. What was he doing on the floor? He didn't know. He picked himself up and into a vacant wheelchair. Doctor, Nurse Nikki said, why are you in a wheelchair? And what's that racket? Doc said, I didn't know. And I didn't know. And he didn't know. He didn't know anything, which is a bad thing for a doctor. His mind was messier than his ongoing divorce. Will you roll me into the ICU, Doc asked. You want me to roll you into the ICU, she said. Yes, he said. I need to get a handle on what's happening here. Roll yourself, she said. I'm on break. 
Speaking of breaks, Doc said there are some phenomenal brownies in the break room. I don't know who brought them, but they're fantastic. I ate like three or four earlier. All gone now, she said. I just had the last one. Now an even stranger sound came from the ICU. It sounded like a theremin playing the guitar solo from Stairway to Heaven. The doctor had heard enough. Enough is enough, Doc said. Come on, Nikki, let's roll. Nikki rolled him into the next room, and the scene was even more inexplicable than he expected. A team of interns had set up a makeshift stage in front of the nurse's station. On stage, they'd had an arrangement of musical instruments scattered about. Doc said, you folks are using the wrong instruments. This is a hospital. Here, one of the interns said, tossing the doctor a tambourine. Music is the best medicine. That's why they call it playing. Pretend we're children, Doc. Let's play. And so they played. They played all night. Between songs, the patients clapped and coughed, coughed and clapped. The coma cases slept. After they finished a particularly raunchy rendition of Over the Rainbow, Nurse Nikki flicked her Bic lighter for an encore. But she held the flame a little too close to an oxygen tank, and it blew everyone away. All right, and this last one is called Climate Change. California was behind me, more spec than spectacle. I sold everything except for my motorcycle and a change of clothes. It was winter, but it felt like spring. The seasons had turned strange. Outside Houston, I was drinking with some old astronauts at the old astronaut bar. One guy had been to space. I asked him what he thought about climate change. He said, I've been to space. I said, yeah? What was that like? He said, it's a lot like climate change. No one cares. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Hi, I'm not muted anymore. Um, my name is Lauren Holy. I'm the managing editor of the Gettysburg Review. And I have no forthcoming work to plug, but I will say what I'm reading from tonight um, is part of a manuscript I've been working on of a novel and stories, and it's the first story that's made it out into the world. So I'm very grateful for that. Hopefully there will be more. Um, I'm reading from the beginning, so there's no real context anyone needs for my story, except for my friends from Redlands who are in the audience. Um, I stole the name The Tartan. The story is actually set in Los Angeles. I don't think I've ever actually eaten there. I just liked how it sounded. Okay, so this is strawberries. That Thursday, Hannah came to work hungover, wearing the same black v-neck and jeans as the day before. Servers at The Tartan were required to wear all black, so she didn't think anyone would notice. But as she slipped into the back office to clock in, her coworker Alyssa said, you spent the night with someone as if she had dressed in boxer shorts and an oversized t-shirt. Hannah let the door shut behind her, leaving Alyssa in the hallway, and was relieved that she didn't follow, startled to find her waiting outside. Who was it? When do I get to meet him? You can't meet him, Hannah said, regretting the implication. I can't? What, was it a one night stand? She leaned forward as she said this, her arms crossed and her mouth hanging open. No, it's not that, Hannah said. She pushed past her toward the dining room where it'd be more difficult to continue their conversation. It both pleased and angered Hannah how shocked Alyssa looked. Alyssa seemed to think Hannah was a Mormon because Hannah didn't wear makeup and didn't have her ears pierced and raised her eyebrows at most things Alyssa said. She'd seen Hannah drinking coffee and reading Al Jazeera articles on her phone when shifts were slow, but this didn't register as secular, misanthropic. Alyssa was only 20 and lived at home. It was still very high school with her. Hannah was the virgin, the nerd. In the dining room, three suburban looking women waited next to the please seat yourself sign. Hannah gestured around the room with an open hand. Anywhere you'd like ladies, she said, and they sat down at the table nearest to where her sweeping motion had ended. Hannah pegged them as the kind of customers who only came to the tartan for lunch. 
Lunch was significantly cheaper because the owners wanted to preserve the restaurant's depression era practice of feeding the poor and downtrodden staff meals out of the shanty. The staff hadn't been fed since the 1980s, but the goal was tourism, not altruism. Twelves, Alyssa whispered over Hannah's shoulder, referring to the women and the tipping percentage she expected, and they'll act like they're being generous. Alyssa always tried to play this game with Hannah, but Hannah usually ignored her. She disliked low tippers and the entitled kinds who thought it was her job to flirt or agree with them. And though she was uncomfortable with the game on an ethical level, she hated it most when she couldn't meet the bar Alyssa had set. Alyssa always seemed to get more than 20%, especially from men, who she had a flirty way of bullying into spending more money, leaning over so her cleavage showed. Hannah thought what Alyssa did was disgusting, but this didn't stop her from feeling like a failure. Hannah had already graduated college and had four unpaid, unappreciated internships at local nonprofits that hadn't led to employment. She was tired, tired of waiting, tired of applying to better jobs, tired of hearing about the wonders of networking, tired of having to sell herself. She had been taught to keep her nose down and work hard. Like most things her religious upbringing had instilled in her, this hadn't helped in the wider world. She was an atheist, but against her better judgment, she still felt deeply Lutheran. When she moved to California for college, she was quiet about her Christianity, which was conflicted even before she got out of it. Out, she always thought, as if her church community were all of St. Louis or a geographic aspect of the region. Eventually, questions of eternal life stopped mattering to her, and she would tell people she was a humanist when religion came up, though working in restaurants had made her less and less certain about the goodness in everyone. Yesterday, after her dinner shift, Hannah had outed herself as a non-believer to Cam Schroeder, a family friend who had been in her older brother's grade. They were getting a drink together at The Prince, a cozy basement bar that TV shows frequently filmed in. Cam had moved to Seattle, and Hannah hadn't seen him in years, but when she noticed on Facebook that he was in town for a week-long conference at UCLA, she reached out. She had been surprised to see him in her feed. She had unfriended most people from home after the 2008 election or in 2014, right after Ferguson. She clicked on his page. He didn't post much, but the last thing had been a Guardian article about racist media coverage of the Ebola outbreak. In his profile picture, he was posed on a bicycle on a trail surrounded by evergreen forest. Hannah was struck by how lush the landscape was, how he hadn't outgrown his easy smile. After sharing a plate of fried gizzards and a pitcher of height with shots of soju dropped in as they dished about their families and other people they vaguely remembered, Cam mentioned their high school gym teacher who had recently passed away. And before heaven could be mentioned, Hannah interjected, I don't believe in God. She explained that a switch had flipped. I'm so relieved, Cam said, exhaling audibly. I don't either. Then it was Hannah's turn to say she was relieved for she hadn't told anyone from home before, hadn't realized that she was ready to, that it was perhaps why she wanted to see him. As their knees bumped under the table, Cam told her the story of how he had been working late one night in the lab during graduate school, when all of a sudden, through the microscope, he saw not just the cancer cells dividing, but the cruel hunger of nature, how impossibly silly it was to believe in a creator. Hearing this, Hannah felt dishonest for using the switch metaphor. She had no lab moment and oddly didn't care about what was possible or impossible. Her loss of faith had been more like a balloon deflating or a frayed rope whose threads had snapped almost imperceptibly, one by one. She kept this a secret from her family because she knew how much it would pain them and she didn't blame them for this. What bothered her was their pity, how sad it was for her to know things, to use critical thinking skills, how her crappy job somehow correlated with her moral failure. When Hannah first moved into her apartment in Koreatown, she attended a community dinner that had been advertised with the sandwich board on the sidewalk. The sign didn't mention that a church sponsored the meal or that the community in question consisted of the homeless people she passed daily, the pit bulls they left tied outside. Hannah was uncomfortable with how the organizers of the event gave her more attention than the, the disheveled men and gutter punks in the buffet line next to her, asking Hannah her name, about her day, where she was from, if she wanted a second brownie or more salad. 
It was as if she were their safest bet, the most likely to be saved. Hannah felt far past saving, and it frustrated her that she still had one foot in the door. Like how her mother always made a point of mentioning her new intergenerational Bible study group when they talked on the phone. Was it because she really enjoyed it, or because Hannah hadn't gone to church since leaving home? Hannah never knew what to say. To admit she would never willingly attend Bible study again would only bring more worry, more prayers, more passive aggressive gifts of devotion books and greeting cards inscripted with Bible verses. She would never be accepted for who she was. Knowing she had slept with Cam would have saddened her mother, but to Hannah, it had been triumphant. Cam and Hannah had had sex in his hotel room, and while it was sloppy, it was tender and Hannah found herself deeply touched by the way he reached up and brushed her hair behind her ears. This person who knew both versions of herself had known her in childhood, had seen her this summer that awful poison ivy rash covered the skin he'd lightly traced with his fingers. She lost her breath a little thinking of this, remembering how undesirable she felt, how at odds with her body. And really, this confirmed everything she knew. She had always found more comfort in moments of human tenderness much more so than a belief in a higher power. Though she left Cam's room early that morning, dressing and searching for her slip-resistant clogs quietly so not to wake him, Hannah felt proud of herself for the encounter, proud of having undone the Puritan values that would have prevented it. She was sex positive in an intellectual armchair activism sense. In practice, she couldn't always tell the difference between a third wave feminist and the patriarchy's willing participant. You are liberated, she'd said to herself in the bathroom mirror that morning as she smoothed her bedhead. There is still something revolutionary to her about expressing desire and having it met. She was leaking with desire, had been practically dissolved by it, waiting in that millennial way, cooking dinner, paying her bills, working for less than the living wage for her adult life to start. Hannah brought her table menus and water glasses. Something about the group depressed her. The middle-aged woman wore a charm bracelet made up of her children's names, the one all middle-aged women seemed to wear. The oldest dressed the same way she might decorate her guest bathroom, a display of seashells and coordinating pinks. The youngest looked mousy, the nub of her ponytail at an awkward height, twelves. So who's the guy, Alyssa said as Hannah returned to the server station. She was slicing lemons, her section still empty. What guy? Hannah grabbed the ice bucket and ducked into the kitchen. She had always been quick to lie. When she was three, her parents had taken her to a U-Pick strawberry patch where she ate mouthfuls of berries as she toddled down the rows. According to the story, as they were leaving, the farmer had asked her, you didn't eat any, did you? And though her face and shirt were covered in red juice, she wasn't in on the joke, had said as coolly as a toddler could, no, strawberries are gross. She threw one scoop of ice into the bucket. Alyssa had just prepped and the cooler had a neatly raked pile in its corner. She pulled out her phone to reread the text Cam had sent her while she was on the bus, asking if she wanted to meet up again. She still hadn't responded. Hannah wasn't sure if she wanted to see Cam a second time. She was worried the magic of their night might be ruined or worse, she might really like him. She could imagine the two of them getting a nice dinner, conversing easily, drinking heavily, and meeting again between his sheets. She could imagine getting breakfast, taking him to LACMA and the La Brea Tar Pits. She could imagine her mother's surprised but pleased Midwestern, oh, on hearing her plans to visit him in Seattle. She could imagine her and Cam getting married and settling down, having a dog or kid, and moving back to the Midwest, closer to their folks. But no. Cam didn't want that either. Thank you. Hi everybody, it's Eekster Murray. I'm so pleased to be here with you. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you, SMR. I'm gonna be reading from a story called Item Number Four, um, which I began writing um, about a year and a half ago when I found out that there had been um, a nuclear meltdown in Simi Valley in 1959 uh, that was several hundred times uh, worse contamination-wise than Three Mile Island, and it has never been cleaned up properly. 
So I thought that was strange. First, that I had never heard about it, and uh, second, that that was the case. And so um, I'm reading to you from one of the products of that befuddlement, item number four. Uh, one of the inspirations for the story uh, was um, the breaking of the story, which was in 1979. Um, so there were 20 years when people didn't know that there had been a nuclear reactor accident in Simi Valley. And Warren Olney uh, in K at KNBC at the time um, broke the story and he said, uh, his, quoting from footage of him, he said, we've obtained films and documents that showed what happened when a nuclear reactor suffered an accident 20 years ago. The reactor was located about five miles from what's now the Topanga Plaza shopping center, 20 miles from Van Nuys, and 30 mi 35 miles from downtown LA. So the story begins. Hazardous waste complaint, number 76127 delivered in person by Sochi Quetzal Henderson, January 4th, 2020, received by Reina Rodriguez, complaint duty officer. I am hoping to register a complaint, Ms. Rodriguez. Every time I return to, down, to town, I do so. At this point, it's become a personal ritual executed in order that I do not forget the things that should not be forgotten, if you know what I mean. Though I, I suppose you could not. You are new to the office, I see. I trust that no one has spoken to you about me. If they have, please disregard what they say. Forgive me for saying so, but my impression is that the functionaries at the department are disagreeable fact of funds with few of the virtues that most people aspire to maintain in order to ensure that this berserk jamboree we call civilization does not fall apart. I am speaking of the official treatment of my inquiries. My many, many inquiries. My inquiries about Santa Susana, what transpired there, what the contagions are, what the suspected etiologies are what the cleanup plan is and what the local and city and state and federal governments intend to do about this mess that they have made and refuse to remediate. Your colleagues have obstructed me at every turn. The lost paperwork, the forwarded calls, the uh, unanswered phones, the emails that received no reply. I have sat in countless offices endeavoring to learn the facts and every time I ask your associates a question, all I receive in return are rank attitudes. I'll have my supervisor get back to you. We are sorry, but we are not permitted to disclose that information. Please fill out these forms in triplicate. Should you like a return call, please leave your number and we will respond as soon as possible. As I have learned through decades of hard experience, as soon as possible is a phrase that when spoken by a government employee possesses as much meaning as have a nice day might have when an asteroid is hurtling its lethal way towards planet Earth. I can see by the way that you are looking at me that uh, you may have had communications with Dennis Ackerley. No, there is no need to deny it. I saw you speaking with him in reception an hour ago. I hope you do not credit anything that he says. He is the person responsible for my tarnished reputation among your cohort, and the one man, man alive whom I would like to see guillotine. I, I am only joking, of course. I, I know that I have the sort of face that makes my edgier efforts at mirth confusing to certain people, but in truth, I am more interested in seeing him banned for life from any sort of bureaucratic position than in arranging for him to be disappeared. Even after all this time, I check up on him every few months or so, and thus I know that he still retains his sinecure at the department, where I assume that he is still setting the standards for the most sandwiches he can eat and the least hours actually worked. It all started in 1984, a portentous year. In my case, however, one is made to think less of George Orwell than of his predecessor, Franz Kafka. Kafka whom I teach at the local city college in my surprisingly unpopular class, Kafka, Derangement Unique de Libique. It is true that in graduate school, Princeton, uh, I possessed only a middling interest in the trial or the castle, being then a cheerfully radical post-colonial critic. But once I moved to Simi Valley, these works author became 
the passion of my life. Poor Franz understood that savages like Dennis Ackerley are trained in a dark magic that with only a well-trained phase, phrase such as, how can I help you? Or let's put a pin in that, can send credulous citizens like myself on mythic journeys, the length and breadth of which would, which would slay most the most stalwart explorer, even though they are conducted solely within the four feet between the reception area of the department and Mr. Ackerley's untidy office. In 1984, I had a question. Mine was not a larger cosmic uncertainty about life and love, and death and pain and suffering and turmoil and horror that is raised by the specter of the pixie dust of death that I imagine glistens in the air around Santa Susana since it was released in 1959. No, my concern at the time was about item number four. Item number four was the fourth item in form 39682A1 the form otherwise known as Hazardous Waste Complaint, or HWC. The most relevant to my case of all the many documents that the department invites the public to complete on puzzlements as various as where to recycle their toxic metals or how to transport electronic waste, but not as it so happens. Whether there have been deposited some nasty little stores of cesium-137 in their backyards. Item number four concerned whom against the HWC was being filed. My question to Mr. Ackerley limbed the delicate issue of whether my HWC needed to be filed against some shadowy whom or nobody at all. As this was the era before the helpful internet, I did not know yet if indeed radionuclides had been released into the area and I should be worried. Only then, if that were the case, would I be able to get to the secondary matter of whom against the manifold account accountable scientists and nabobs and hacks and governors I should incriminate. I'm not sure what to put here, I said to Mr. Ackerley that first day we met. I sat straight and alert in the dented metal chair he had positioned across from his paper laden desk. You're supposed to put the name of the company you're complaining against, he said pleasantly while folding his fingertips over his comfortable belly. Yes, but I do not yet know if there is anything really to complain about, I said, rattling the paper at him. Do you have a form for when a person is confused about whether lethal filth is, in fact, fluttering into the very air that their children breathe and invisibly attaching, like barnacles to teddy bears and stirring itself into the family soup? I, I don't understand the, the question, Mr. Ackerley said. It is just that before I may name a malefactor on this form, I must know if some sort of malefaction has been committed. Mr. Ackerley only blinked at me. There have been some reports on the television about a horrible accident that was supposed to have happened here in 1959, and I would like to know if they are true. I'm not privy to that information, Mr. Ackerley said. But you are a regional supervisor of the department, I said, pointing at the nameplate on his messy desk. If you do not know if that, that there are toxic substances in the vicinity that need controlling, who does? It sounds like maybe you have a police complaint, Mr. Ackerley said. My good man, I spluttered. It is a simple question. Are we in danger? Mr. Ackerley looked around his office and fanned out his hands. Everything seems fine to me. But that's the thing, isn't it? I went on. One never knows. Isn't that the truth? Mr. Ackerley said. One never knows. He stood up. Are you done with the form? Are you going to address, address my concern? He smiled and took the paper back from me. We'll get back to you as soon as possible, ma'am. Oh, as soon as possible, I said, mollified. Well, when is that precisely? Within the next week or so, he said. Next week, I repeated, or month, maybe, he said. Next month, I said, and you'll tell me whether there is a problem or not. Yup, Mr. Ackerley said. And just as I was explaining that I had written both my home and work number on line eight of the HWC, he muttered something about lunch and unceremoniously escorted me back out of his office door. As it was not, when, it was not one of my teaching days, I went to my house. My son, Lawrence, soon arrived home in his full soccer regalia and began clamoring for dinner. I frisked about the kitchen, assembling an elaborate health food cassoulet, his father's favorite. 
I stabbed at the onions and pummeled the beans and whacked at the carrots until my masterpiece filled the house with its perfume. I sat down at the table and delighted at the sight of Lawrence gobbling down every last crumb on his plate and asking for more. What's wrong, Lawrence said, chewing. Nothing, I said. Mom, he said. I love you, I said. You're wigging out about something. Do you want more milk? Yes, he said. I rose from the table and fetched the milk carton from the refrigerator and came back to the living room and poured it for him. Lawrence drained the glass and said, you have a big vein sticking out of your forehead. I waggled my fingers through my bangs so as to hide any evidence of my anxiety. Save room for dessert, I said, as I reached over to gently remove a moat of cassoulet from his glowing, beautiful cheek. The whole next week, I consulted our brand new answering machine several times a day. I am a skeptic by nature and affiliation, but began nevertheless praying to God that Mr. Ackerley would respond to my query with a soothing response. It was all cleaned up long ago, I imagined him saying, as he cited charts and diagrams confirming that the greatest health hazard in Simi Valley was its legions of city college students who remained uninterested in wielding the ax against the frozen sea within us despite the best efforts of their teachers. You can rest easy, I dreamed of him telling me, while he quoted from papers and exhaustive studies that established that the most perilous toxin in Simi Valley was its lack of bookstores and advanced culture. But the call did not come. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much for your time and for listening to me. This is wonderful. Hello. Um, that was fantastic. All these readings are great so far. I'm so happy to be here. Um, hi, I'm Sean Bernard. I direct the creative writing program at the University of Laverne in Southern California. My stories have appeared in a few journals, including Lauren's, which is fun. Um, and my most recent book is a collection of Tucson stories titled Desert Sonoris. I want to say that this event is wonderful again. Um, thanks, Keenan and Andrew and Joy behind the scenes. Thanks to my fellow readers and thanks to everyone in attendance. It's great to not quite see you. Um, Tonight I'll be reading not quite the entirety of my story, The San Gabriel Complex. It was written a few years ago in response to an enormous fire in one of the mountain ranges here in Los Angeles County. Um, it's regrettably a little timely as this year has been the worst fire season in California history with already over 4 million acres burned. Um, it's been terrible. Uh, writing about these fires, I can't quiet traffic, sorry. Um, writing about these fires and the accompanying Santa Ana winds is a literary tradition of sorts. Authors from Joan Didion to Richard Lang have done it. Um, I think it's because fire is a particularly particularly unsettling natural disaster. It creates an apocalyptic feeling and that both the air and the literal color of things change. And the effect is very, very disturbing. Um, and I tried to explore that in this story. And just a quick heads up uh, before I start reading, our narrator is a bit demented and tries to hide his worst tendencies. So it's a little bit shifty here. The San Gabriel Complex. The skies make you feel like something's wrong. The light, this light, doesn't look right. It's got hue, mood, meaning. It's like what? Like there's a layer of blood in the air that no one can see, and the light has to pass through it, and then it hits us, and the shadow of the blood hits us too. They say two kids went missing last week in a new neighborhood where the trees aren't tall and probably won't ever be. The houses are tall though. It happened during the evacuation when the hills caught fire. I wasn't surprised to learn about the missing kids. I read the news on a local TV station website in the town library. There were pictures of men in uniform looking serious, rubbing their chins. I couldn't see myself in any of the backgrounds, but I looked. One librarian recognizes me now, a short, darting woman. She always sneaks up behind me and taps the computer screen. That's how she enforces the 15-minute limit. I should study her schedule so that I can go back when she's gone. The house was in the part of the new neighborhood that ended in a cul-de-sac. The cul-de-sac edged right into the hills, and over the edge of the closest hill was the ravine that was full of creeping fire. It was like you could feel the flames starting to whisper, to gather and to march, like they were sniffing the air for victims. I just realized I don't even know what cul-de-sac means. 
The street had about a dozen screaming fire trucks. They weren't moving. Just as many ambulances, double the police, cow-necked cops walking up and down house to house, always talking into those walkie-talkies attached to their shoulders. I always think it makes them look ashamed talking into their shoulders the way they do. But they were knocking on doors, shouting confidently through doorways, get out, get out, it's time to get out of here. In that situation, if my house were to burn, I wonder, what would I take? Sometimes it worries me. Maybe I'd get the microwave and not the cat. Not to mention the news helicopters. They make the fires feel hotter. I felt like one helicopter, white with red stripes, was circling above just for me. Its camera aimed just at me. I looked again at the article's pictures and then I paused. There she was, the kid's mother. I remembered her because she didn't cry like you'd expect. She had on a big saucery hat that seemed flimsy. And she wore a bright yellow dress with little flowers growing on it. A cop had a hand on her shoulder and was carrying a light blue backpack that seemed to belong to her. I wondered what it held. Her eyes looked lost as she walked along. Her arms were ringed in canvas bags that had all sorts of angles inside them, like they'd frantically swallowed glass instead of the things they were supposed to carry. The cop, he sort of guided her the way you would a blind person, all while speaking that bashful way into his walkie-talkie. Fire season has been good to me, and now it's growing. It's all fire season anymore, the news reports say. I tried to explain this once to the librarian. She doesn't listen, or anyway doesn't show it. Her eyes shift and she taps the computer. It's in the evenings that I go into the homes. The cops are all cleared out, the helicopters. The air is tired after all the agitation. There's such calm after such great excitement. Even with the fire nearby, it feels calm and hushed because, and I've learned this, it's not what people think. It's not fire that makes everything feel electric. It's people, how they act. The evening air has that quiet red tint to it, that throaty tang. I should go faster through the houses. I know, I've had the talk with myself plenty. But what can you do about the way you just are? I can't help but linger. Otherwise, what's the point? If I linger, it all takes on meaning. The act has meaning, which is all I ever want. I'd like to take the stuff you can't touch, but that's impossible. I walk the rooms, the halls. I look at photos on the walls. You can tell that some have been taken and some left behind because of the empty rectangles next to the filled ones. In the kids' rooms, the posters, the little orange hoops tucked into the door jamb, the lacy lamps on the nightstands. I like the refrigerators a lot, the sliced turkey in the deli drawer. I'll roll up a slice and dip it into a jar. I dipped it into a pickle jar once and it tasted sour, like the fires had passed over everything, curing it all before they even burned the house down. I'm never surprised to find vodka in the freezer. It's too cold to drink out of the bottle. I learned the hard way. Now I let it sit there on the counter as I walk through the house, gathering. Crazier still, you look up above the mountains and the fires and the smoke. The sky is so clean and calm bluer than blue, like it just wants to ignore everything and get on with it. I understand that. And the light feels, too. Fire days, the light is hotter on your skin. When I go out into the sunlight anymore, which anyone is crazy to do, I wrap my arms in socks. Maybe she wanted them to be left behind. What mother forgets her kids? Probably now that I think about it, lots of them. Last night, during the San Gabriel complex fire inside the woman's house, a gray stucco two-story at the very end of the cul-de-sac, a guy came home, like at the end of any workday. He was humming this loud, cheerful hum. He wore an unconvincing mustache and a dark jacket, which I took to mean that he didn't belong there either. He entered through the front door. I stood in the lowered living room, thinking maybe I'd let the vodka go too long. The door opened, he stepped in, looking back out through it, checking behind himself, and he closed it slowly before turning into the house. I could have moved or hidden, but I'm not fast. He stepped in, shut it, and saw me. He smiled and kept humming. 
An hour earlier, I'd taken in the picture on the mantle. I felt like I knew this family. The daughter and son were white-haired kids. I don't mean their skin was pale, just that they were so blonde it looked white, like people whose color gets frightened out of them. That's a thing I've heard anyway. I'd held the picture and wondered if they knew already what would someday happen to them, and that's why their hair was white. The other people in the pictures were older. The mother, her I'd seen, and this blonde guy on a jet ski. He had a blue puffy vest and an arm around the mother. The kids were behind them. I don't know if they looked afraid or excited. It's one of those fine lines. Well, said the man, whose hair was not at all blonde. He said, here we are. I couldn't open my mouth. He seemed pleased with this. He turned down the hall and headed upstairs. I left soon after. I felt so tired. The song he'd been humming stuck in my head, but I didn't know the name. I tried to remember, and it was only much later that I realized he had followed me home. He was in my apartment before I even got there. And I think I'm going to stop right there. A little cliffhanger for you. Um, thank you very much. I'm unmuted. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm so delighted to, to be part of this lineup. These have been fantastic readings. Um, it's just so good to hear um, people's language, too. Um, and I want to take a few of my moments um, to recognize Andrew Tonkovich. Um, time and time again, Andrew Tonkovich has brought us together in these readings as introducers or as audience um, or as readers. Um, he has for well over 25 years brought our minds into conversation with his masterful and fearless editing of the Santa Monica Review. And when he himself wrote his own fiction and commentary, I do not know, but he did. So the diary of Anne Frank and more wish fulfillment in the noughties came out it was published in 2019, and now just out from What Books Press is Andrew Tonkovich's collection, Keeping Tahoe Blue and Other Provocations. It has a pretty wonderful cover by Gronk. And I just want to um, take some of my time to recognize what Andrew has done for so many of us and for so many writers. And that he himself is, is a writer of consummate abilities. Um, and I'm just so happy these books have come out. It just makes me um, inordinately happy. So um, I'm going to read you just a few pages, four pages from an essay called uh, Autobiography. And it is an essay. Uh, it is in third person. Uh, it's just a girl, she's eight or nine. And she's riding her bicycle uh, down alleys in Denver. And uh, she's been shipped off to her grandparents um, while her parents carry on a rather rancorous divorce. Um, and um, I think the only thing you need to know is that she's been raised thus far by two pretty serious atheists. Um, so I think th that might be helpful uh, as a, a kind of a little sense of her mind. Um, uh, so this is just excerpted from a, a bigger piece and there's, there's different things about alleys, but, um, so this is about eight pages in. So she has taken to walking down alleys in Los Angeles, though that is not exactly accurate. She has always loved alleys since the time she was a child and in Denver, the one year she was a child and the alleys that ran down behind the blocks of bungalows held a kind of insight for her, a way of seeing in. For one thing, there were incinerators along the back fences. Incinerator, a word she has known since that time. She was eight, then nine. The incinerator, people standing behind their houses, tending these rectangular cement structures, tall as a stove, 
smoke billowing from their tops, burning what would now seem to us so very little, a few newspapers, a bit of kitchen garbage, and sometimes something important that her grandfather would tend until it was a finished mound of ash, making sure no charred bit of a document remained. But she supposes is why she thinks of plot today the way she does, her resistance to plot depending on someone stupid enough to burn half the document, its legend of lawyer names still legible, or the shaky signature half there just readable enough for an all points bulletin and the plot is on its way. No, plots that depended or progressed upon a character's stupidity, oftentimes a woman's, did not interest her ever because just the fact that someone stood there tending a burning incinerator seemed interesting enough, vital enough, without making the intrigue trite. The woman who rises from her bed after having not done so for 30 years, wraps her body in a gorgeous dressing gown, gliding out into the long yard, only to burn half of what she is so desperate to hide. So desperate she takes to her legs after not having done so for 30 years, she hated that kind of narrative crap. And many years later, she had amused a professor of hers by telling him that when she first read Jane Eyre, maybe she was 12 or 13, she was incensed. Oh yeah, now that Rochester's blind and a cripple and basically homeless, now, now you marry him, Jane? I don't think so, you little idiot. In Denver, in that summer, she was a child. Alleys had fruit, too, and the trees planted at the bottom of the garden, and so their boughs draping across back fences dropped fruit, or fruit still hung. And if she was on a bike, she could make a pass and reach up and have the peach in hand with no one the wiser, or not wise enough fast enough to catch her, no voice coming down from the heavens. Uh, the voice booming with authority, what is this that thou hast done? Or maybe God wasn't in the firmament when he said that. Maybe he was walking about the Garden of Eden at that point, looking for Adam and Eve after they dared to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All of this story of Genesis knew to her, knew this year she was a child, taken to Bible study classes by her devout, Presbyterian grandmother. I got a peach, she'd exclaimed to herself, holding it up above the handlebars of her bike, showing God or whomever she was now supposed to believe was up there. And sometimes she'd get plums, sometimes cherries, apricots, Edenic, these alleys in their way. But something so very wrong with that plot too. God wanting to be the one to make babies. Is that it? God wanting it so much that he does a ribectomy on Adam and voila, a guy is making a baby now? Because even if she's a fully grown woman, poof, Genesis, a man is making a baby. Okay, okay, just once to get the story rolling, just go with it. It's a given, a done, as Henry James would phrase it. God makes the first baby. Come on, just suck it up. Let a guy make a baby once. Go with that speck, that kernel, go with the story. If Grega Samsa can wake up and realize, oops, those are antennae now, not hands, then God can be the first man to make a baby. Except, she keeps reminding herself, it was a fully grown woman, like God makes a big doll for Adam with a rib. Criminy, the plots girls are supposed to just buckle themselves down into. And she wouldn't have all of those thoughts in those words, but she did have a whole head full of resistance. And she'd steer her bike around the end of the alley onto the sidewalk for a stretch, and then off the sidewalk to cross a street, and then back onto a sidewalk before she could turn down another alley and enter into its surprises, which often weren't grand or even much surprising. Someone's laundry hanging out to dry, the presence of clothing that had once needed washing, that had once had something of someone's life within its fibers, and that something now washed out, or mostly washed out, and the fabric within the truth of air drying. She didn't mind that sight as a girl, 
watching a woman standing in her yard, her breasts and hips shrouded in a sheet's damp cling, and then her body freed as she tamed the broad, billowing expanses up onto a clothesline and pegged its corners down, because that seemed something else really hinky about that Genesis story, that God wanted Adam and Eve naked and stupid. What's that about? That just seemed really, really, really weird to her. Because if God didn't want Eve bored to tears out of every pore in her body, why didn't he give Eve something to do? She recognized the storyline every time she got to watch an episode on television of I Love Lucy, which wasn't often, but all Lucy ever really wants is something to do, a job, just something to relieve the boredom. And you can betcha that if there had been an episode with a tree hanging with the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, Lucy would have picked and eaten as much as Lucy could have. And she'd made the mistake that year, that one year she was a child, of telling her grandmother that I Love Lucy reminded her of the story in the book of Genesis, but that she thought she liked I Love Lucy a little better because the plots didn't depend on a talking snake. And her grandmother had not been pleased at all. It's not a talking snake, her grandmother said. It's Lucifer. It's the devil. Oh, she said, isn't it a talking snake? Perhaps she had missed something, but she could hear her Sunday school teacher's voice reading the verses. And she was pretty sure that Eve and the serpent were having a chat. And the serpent said unto the woman, she had taken to keeping her thoughts to herself because before that year in Denver, before that year without her parents, if she had ever said to them that she was bored, they'd say back to her, boredom is self-induced, which she understood to mean that boredom was her problem, not theirs. And she further understood that if she was the source of the boredom, then it was she herself who was boring. This made sense to her. And it also created very early in her the knowledge that the answer to boredom might actually be her parents. She would seek to find out as much as she could about adults, why they acted the way they did, why they did such miserable things to each other. Even that young, she hated fantasy, make-believe, its trite idiocy. But in Denver that year, that one year she was a child, she moved on her bicycle so briskly down alleys and across streets, so rarely anyone else there. And she'd bike around Washington Park to its inner circle, scattering the geese, their officious waddles, their frantic honking. And this speed, her body lifted up off the seat, her knees standing and then pressing down and forward and standing again and pressing down and moving forward so freely, so fast, no impediments, no storylines to rankle the mind, her own peer transports, transports a work in her head. One entered an alley, the one turned down a street or onto a street, and she could hear her grandfather giving her grandmother directions, enter on the alley and I'll help with the groceries, as though alleys were a special portal. And so she'd come out of the park with its willow-lined lake, that people still could not swim in because of polio, and she'd find another alley to travel down. Often, too, she'd dismount and walk her bike, peering into people's backyards, an empty swing suspended from the limb of an elm, or a table set with tall iced tea glasses, a fan of long-handled iced tea spoons glinting in sunlight. A woman in an apron would emerge from her back door, the screen door slapping behind, carrying a pitcher that matched the glasses, one hand wrapped around the pitcher's handle, the other holding it beneath, the heavy pitcher tinkling with ice, which she could hear all the way in the alley, the distant, easy chiming of that ice. Ladies coming soon, the woman's friends, or perhaps her children and their friends. But she pressed on, her bike snapping over the long green pods of a catalpa tree, catalpa. She liked saying catalpa, like the tree's huge heart-shaped leaves, their luscious green catalpa, catalpa, catalpa. Once the man who lived there had been out collecting the yellow and black caterpillars from the leaves, a 
and putting them into a large Folgers coffee can he had placed atop his ladder. He'd gather a few catapa worms, pick up the orange box of Albers cornmeal he had up there too, sprinkle some in, and then close the box top of the cornmeal, and then gather some more caterpillars and drop them in, open the cornmeal box again and sprinkle some in, and carefully close it back up. The fish love them, he called out to her from his ladder. Yum, 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 he said and laughed. He filled up the rest of the can with caterpillars and then cornmeal, and then secured the opaque plastic lid on the coffee can. Don't they die, she called, standing beside her bike, projecting her voice. And then she thought that might be and probably was a stupid question. But somewhere in the back of her mind, she heard one of her uncles say fish were attracted to live bait, and that's why one cast and recast when fly fishing. So the fish thought the flies were alive. Well, the man called down to her, it's the craziest thing. I put this coffee tin in the freezer until my brother and I go fishing. We like going up near Estes Park. And by the time we get up there, these catapa worms are as alive as they can be. Best bait ever. Bye, she called, not knowing always how to respond to information like this, not really wanting the image in her mind of this man and his brother, their fingers coated in cornmeal, looping back and forth onto their fishing hooks, these fleshy yellow and black creatures suddenly alive again and wiggling. Way of the world, she could hear her grandfather say, shaking his head, way of the world. And somehow she'd known there'd be hell to pay because the man was placing the empty Albers cornmeal box into the incinerator. His wife would have an egg and some butter set out to make muffins. And there'd be worms in her freezer and no cornmeal. There was a house with a tinier house behind. And the tinier house's stoop was tiered with tin cans, their labels still on, shredded beets and white hominy and great northerns, and each can had a plant in it, just beginning to grow, just beginning to peek up with anticipation into the sunlight. She felt soothed by these seedling plants reaching for their lives from their odd assortment of tin cans filled with a little dirt. What were their stories? What were they going to grow up to be? Autobiography. She'd learned its definition in school an account of a man's life by himself. She put her leg through her bike and rose up onto the seat and pushed a foot down on a pedal and settled her other foot, her knees pressing down, her tires moving spoonly beneath her, crunching over more catalpa pods and now a slick of choke cherries. She wondered why an autobiography couldn't be about a man and all the other people in his life, why it had just to be by himself. So much in school that didn't ever quite seem true or accurate. An account of a woman's life by herself. That had a way of seeming correct. The solitariness somehow truer about her. Somehow always a woman set off from the others, even as others were entirely the focus of her attentions, entirely who she was to be about. So thank you for being invited by Santa Monica Review and thank all the other readers. And I think that I'm the final thank you and I think we get to hear from Andrew now. Thank you friends. Uh, thanks to my co-host Keenan Norris, to Ryan Ridge, Lauren Holy, Ixta Maya Murray, Sean Bernard, and Michelle Latiolet. Thanks to all of you for your generosity, especially at this particular moment. I'll close, if you don't mind, with a few lines from one of my favorite anthems by one of my favorite poets, Patti Smith. And my senses newly opened, I awakened to the cry that the people have the power to redeem the work of fools Upon the meek, the graces shower. It's decreed, the people rule. 
Thank you all for tuning in. Goodbye.